Today, we will explore elastography. Elastography is an aspect of ultrasound that has been developed to image and evaluate tissue stiffness. Since ancient times, palpation has been used by doctors to explore the stiffness and mobility of findings in the body. Palpation is a process of looking for lumps and bumps and the shape of different parts of the body. It can be used to detect if something feels too big or too small, or if there is a mass. How does the mass feel? Can you move the mass? Is the mass hard or squishy? Does the mass compress? Elastography is made to enhance the palpation testing results and verify the results of palpation. Most importantly, elastography can detect deeper lumps and bumps that are not detected by palpation. There are two main types of elastography that we will be covering. The first type is quasi-static and the second is shear elastography. Here is a visual image that gives you a brief intro to the difference between the two types of elastography. Strain, also known as quasi-static, was the original type of elastography developed. Elastography has now been expanded to include shear wave elastography. As you can see in the image, strain compares the before and after effects of tissue compression, while shear watches how the sounds react to the compression or vibration of a structure. I'll turn it over to Victor now to explain the ins and outs of quasi-static elastography. Quasi-static, also known as static or strain elastography, is an earlier elastography technique than shear wave, and was just known as elastography back when it was first developed in the early 1990s. The basic idea behind it is that it compares data before and after compression of tissue and produces an elastogram. Sounds simple enough, but let's actually learn a bit more about how this works. First of all, what would be considered a compression? This has nothing to do with the receiver function of compression we previously learned about. The compression we're talking about in this chapter is just some sort of force or stress that's applied to the tissue causing it to deform. It got squashed. It could be like having the sonographer really push the transducer onto the patient. This would be considered an external compression. Or it could be an internal compression where the sonographer just puts the transducer on the patient and the patient's physiology, like breathing, does the compression work for us? Now, before we actually apply a compression, we need a reference point to compare to. So the transducer sends its signal towards the area or structure of interest, the echoes come back, image data is acquired, represented on this picture. A compression is then made, and the acquired post-compression image data will look similar to the previous image data, only that it shifted or moved, seen here. The ultrasound machine then does cross-correlation, which is just a fancy way of saying that it's just trying to match the data points between pre- and post-compression. How much the data ended up shifting because of the compression is the displacement, giving us an idea of how much the tissue moved. Softer or more elastic tissue will have a larger displacement of data. They deformed and got compressed, squashed. How much they deform is known as strain. Stiffer or inelastic tissue will have a smaller displacement of data, they will not be as compressed, the strain will be smaller. If we learned anything in the thousands of years of using palpitation, stiff tissue is generally not a good thing. From this information, an elastogram, an image of tissue strain, will be made. The elastogram can be displayed side by side with the sonogram, and stiffer tissues will be darker and softer tissues will be brighter. It can also be a color image overlaid on top of our 2D image. You can use any color you want, but the default color for stiff tissues for most machines appears to be blue. Of course, this is all based on relative stiffness. If a lesion, for example, which is very stiff, covers the entire elastogram, we wouldn't know any better. We would just think it's normal. So an elastogram isn't so great if the abnormality is diffuse, being widespread throughout an area. An elastogram, however, is highly effective in detecting focal abnormalities, like finding a localized lesion in an otherwise overall healthy looking tissue. But how do we know whether an elastogram is appropriate to use for diagnostic interpretation? It's difficult to say whether an elastogram is a good one, but here's an extreme example of a really nasty one. It looks like a blur. Most of the time, determining an elastogram's quality by eye isn't gonna be so easy. So a nice thing the ultrasound machine does for us is present a quality indicator on the screen. It does this through complex algorithms and can be displayed as either a number 
or a piece of a circle. The higher the number, or the more of the circle it covers, the better quality the elastogram. We can then put more trust into the image in determining what's going on in the body. On some machines, if the quality is considered to be too low, for example less than 70, it will not display the elastogram, telling the sonographer to maybe try again. Now, even if the displayed elastogram was considered appropriate, we would then have to determine whether an area of tissue is stiff. Some people didn't like making that decision by eye, and ended up coming up with a quantitative way, a way of using numbers, to decide whether a part of tissue was stiff, being a potential lesion, or not. And that is the strain ratio, a ratio of the strain of the suspected lesion divided by the strain of healthy tissue. The user would pick a point on the suspected lesion, and then a point of healthy tissue, popular choices being fat or skeletal muscles, giving the user a number. Static elastography definitely has its uses, but it's not perfect. It relies on compressions, either external or internal, that are highly variable. The amount of force applied to the tissue will not be constant, and will differ every time, which means the results are also highly variable and not as easily reproducible. Strain elastography is used to evaluate the macroscopic structure of specific tissues such as the breast, liver, prostate, thyroid, and musculoskeletal structures. Breast elastography is one of the most common uses for strain elastography. It is used in conjunction with B-mode imaging in order to confirm results. However, invasive lobular cancer and complicated cysts in the breasts are solely identified using elastography since they are not visible in regular B-mode imaging. There are three main methods to identify breast lesions. The first is the Subaka scale, which is a five-point color scale that produces a color pattern based on breast lesion stiffness relative to the background tissue. As the score increases, the probability for the malignancy increases. Around score three is when it is more difficult to make a distinction between benign and malignant cysts. It is most likely benign, but you cannot be 100% sure without a biopsy. We can also use the fat lesion ratio to determine breast lesions. This is when a region of interest is placed within a lesion and a reference area is placed in surrounding fat tissue. It is necessary for both of these regions to be at the same depths. We should avoid placing the region of interest near blood vessels since the movement of blood cannot produce artificial effects of displacement therefore affecting our ratio and creating the possibility for inaccurate results. There is a higher suspicion for malignancy when the fat lesion ratio is a higher number. The last method we can use to identify breast lesions is the width slash EI slash B ratio. This is when a maximum diameter measurement is taken of the lesion on B mode and then the measurement is taken on elastogram. These values are then compared. It is common for the lesions to appear larger on the elastogram. Strain elastography is also used to determine the stiffness in fibrotic livers. Fibrotic livers arise from chronic diffuse liver disease and will begin to develop lesions. These lesions need to be measured in multiple frames, ranging between 5 to 10, in order to provide an accurate median value. From the median stiffness value obtained, along with other values relating to fibrosis, we can calculate the liver fibrosis index. A higher index proves a stiffer lesion. Strain elastography is used to detect prostate cancer, as well as provide guidance for potential biopsies. However, this is used as an additional method to transrect ultrasound and MRI as they are the still the most accurate imaging technique in this case. The tissue stiffness information provided by ultrasound elastography should improve the detection of prostate cancer and provide guidance for biopsy. Prostate cancer will appear as a stiff lesion. Elastography provides high sensitivity for detecting prostate cancer and shows high negative predictable values, ensuring that few cancers are missed. Thyroids are evaluated using both strain and shear elastography. Thyroid nodules with Rago's score 1 to 3 were found to be benign, while score 4 to 5 had an elastographic feature suggestive for malignancy. There is only about 5 to 10 percent of thyroid nodules found with a score of five, 4 to 5 being malignant. A common type of musculoskeletal condition detected by elastography is plantar fasciitis. 
Typical ultrasound findings would be a thickened plantar fascial layer, loss of normal striation, a hypoechoic lesion, and perifascial fluid. These may not be always seen though. Morphological changes visible on B-mode imaging may indicate fascial softening on elastograph. Strain elastography of plantar fasciitis provides information about the mechanical properties during the very early stage of inflammation before any macroscopic changes take place. The image beside plantar fasciitis is from a 72-year-old woman presented with right sole pain and discomfort during weight-bearing activities. The 2D image on the left reveals a thickened right plantar fascia. Simultaneous strain elastography on the right displays a green to red color in most of the lesion, where are the arrows pointing, indicating a softening of the plantar fascia. We can also detect Achilles tendon. It appears as either homogeneously hard, but is mostly more than 60% inhomogeneously soft, displaying as longitudinal bands or spots. Most asymptomatic tendons tend to be consistently hard in these cases, ranging from 86 to 93% and some contained mild softening and marked softening. On the other hand, symptomatic tendons showed significant softening in 57%, mild softening in 11%, and no softening or appearing as hard structures in the other cases. The elastography image on top displays an intense blue shaded Achilles tendon in an elderly person. The bottom image is from a young individual and shows a homogeneous stiff tendon by shades of blue and relatively soft linear areas in shades of green. Torticollis, also called CMT, is a common congenital disorder in neonates and infants that can also be detected by elastography. Patients with CMT have decreased elasticity compared to normal muscles, and strain elastography showed stiffness in those subjects. The image displays a five-month-old boy that underwent an ultrasound due to head tilting to the right side. The B-mode image on the left reveals marked thickening of the sternum muscle with heterogeneous echogenicity. Simultaneous strain elastography on the right shows a predominantly blue area within the muscle, where the arrow is located, representing a stiff consistency. The last kind of tumor detected by musculoskeletal is a soft tissue. These are malignant tumors and are generally stiffer than benign tumors. They will appear blue on strain elastography. Lipomas can range in color from red to blue. Vascular soft tissue tumors such as hemangiomas were red to green with no blue, and neurogenic tumors were green and no blue. Malignant tumors showed higher strain scores, usually between 3 and 4. The ultrasound image and elastography image demonstrate a 33-year-old man with a palpable mass on his right chin. The B-mode image and strain elastography reveal a well-marginated soft mass in the subcutaneous fat layer. Strain elastography on the right shows a predominantly orange area within the mass representing a soft consistency. Those are the current uses of strain elastography. Okay, so now I'm going to be introducing dynamic or shear elastography. So dynamic elastography uses vibration or rapid external compressions to determine the stiffness of tissue. Unlike with strain elastography, the tissue stiffness is not directly measured through palpation, but rather the perpendicular waves produced by these vibrations are tracked and imaged as they go through the body. The velocity of these waves is then measured, which is used to provide quantitative values that determine the stiffness of tissue. Early elastography used color Doppler to generate these quantitative estimates. Once the color is turned on, the Frematis method is applied and used to detect breast lesions. To apply this Frematis method, we simply ask the patient to hum. This humming provides a vibration that moves the tissue enough to be picked up by color Doppler. There is a significant disadvantage to this method, however. People hum at different pitches and volumes, so the results are highly subjective, and some may not even be sensitive to color Doppler. To overcome these disadvantages, the University of Rochester designed a method using color Doppler along with an external vibration device in 1988. This is known as sonoelasticity. This allows the results to be more standardized, preventing any discrepancies that may come about with individual humming. When we use shear elastography today, we use an external vibration device to apply compression to the tissue. This causes shear waves to be produced. So what are shear waves exactly? 
Shear waves travel perpendicular to the compressional wave and are much slower than the compressional waves. This is the fact that makes it possible to track this wave. To track them, we look for small displacements of the tissue in the lateral dimension. Now, if I could get you to look at the picture here, um, we can appreciate that the push pulses, or the compressional waves, in the green create the shear waves, which are shown in blue. These travel perpendicular to the push pulse. The transducer then sends out tracking pulses, depicted as the red arrows, which then measure the tissue displacement caused by the shear waves. By sending multiple sets of tracking pulses, the velocities of the shear waves can then be estimated. The image on the far left of this slide is another version of the image outlined on the previous. To outline this in another way, I will go through the process of shear elastography. In step one, we will generate shear waves by using acoustic radiation force, a force that's used to move physical objects with sound. And this is moved into the body. Next, we will track the shear waves with an ultrasound and determine the tissue displacement by using a speckle tracing algorithm. This algorithm is very complex, so you don't have to worry about the specifics. Finally, the displacement measurements are used to calculate the velocity of the shear waves along with the shear modulus, more simply known as the modulus of rigidity or stiffness. These values are then displayed and related on a color bar that estimates the density of this tissue, as shown in the picture in the middle of the screen. On the far right of the screen, we see several equations. These equations are applied to, by the machine to calculate the shear modulus and the velocity of the shear waves. So our first equation here on the side is G equals BS multiplied by P. This is the shear modulus equation. G is the shear modulus. Vs stands for the shear velocity, and P is the density of the tissue, which is assumed to be equal to the density of water, so 1. Our next equation, E equals G times D, is the Young's modulus equation. This is the more commonly used modulus or stiffness equation, and it's directly proportional to the shear modulus. E represents the Young's modulus. Again, G stands for the shear modulus. And lastly, we have the constant D, which is usually close to 3 in biological tissues. This ties into our final equation, as D is equal to 2 times the sum of 1 plus V. Sadly, V here does not stand for velocity. V actually stands for Poisson's ratio, which we will get more into on our next slide. Poisson's ratio is the ratio of lateral to longitudinal strain caused by the compression or stretching of a material. More simply, this is defined as the ratio of the change in the thinning compared to the stretching. The value of Poisson's ratio usually ranges between 0 and 0 0.5, 0 0.5 being perfectly incompressible. Thinning occurs perpendicular to the stretch direction, while stretching obviously is parallel to the stretch direction. Tensile deformation, or stretching, is considered to be positive, while compression deformation is considered to have a negative value. The image you see here is depicting tensile deformation. You can see that as you stretch the material out in the longitudinal or axial dimension, the lateral dimension actually becomes smaller, or it gets thinner. If you wanted to visualize compression deformation, the hands in the image would have to be moving towards one another rather than apart. Acoustic radiation force impulse imaging, commonly referred to as AFRI, is what it is called when we use an external vibration device, such as a piston-mounted transducer, to provide vibration. This type of transducer can be used for both shear and strain elastography. For strain, the piston is the modality that applies the external compression. For shear, the piston can generate the shear waves, which will enable us to assess the stiffness of a particular area. The images on the side here are just some examples of piston-mounted transducers. As you may be able to infer, magnetic resonance elastography, or MRE, does not use a sonographic approach. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is used to generate shear waves within the body, save images of the propagation of the shear waves using MRI technology, and then process these acquired images to generate quantitative maps of tissue stiffness or elastograms. Finally, we have poroelastography. Poroelastography creates images that reflect fluid movement in tissue. With this method, tissue is viewed as a porous substance that contains liquids. 
Pressure is applied with the transducer and multiple images are recorded to produce multiple static elastograms over time. The Poisson's ratio is then calculated at every point it we see in these images to show fluid movement. This method is still under experimentation and lymphedemas are often used for this. And uh, now we are going to go into the uses of shear. So they're quite similar to what Haley was talking about with the strain elastography, uh, with the uses being like breast, liver, prostate, thyroid, musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal and also cardiography. But since she already went into detail about those, I'll just go into a couple specifics and also ones that are mainly used. So I'll mainly talk about breast and liver and then go into AFRI, MRE, and paroelastography. So for breast elastography, again, I won't go into it too much because it's quite similar to strain, but the shear waves actually tell us about the bulk modulus, and using the shear waves, we can assess the velocity for the, and the elasticity for each, each pixel. And for the liver, along with looking for lesions, the reason we'd usually be using shear is to evaluate the stiffness and also find out how far along things like fatty infiltration or cirrhosis are. Okay, so this is where things get a little more specific. So for acoustic radiation force impulse imaging, or AFRI for short, because that's kind of a mouthful, uh, so it's one of the ways that shear is used. So it's similar to the other ways where it measures the stiffness of the tissue. Uh, generally, you would scan intercostally. <clears throat> one of the main reasons for this is there's specific depth limitations, which is about six centimeters. So any deeper than this, and the push pulse will attenuate, and then the measurements are pretty much not measurable anymore. So to assess the region of interest, a push pulse is applied, and after that, a speed is measured, but it's more like an estimate and less of a measurement. Um, and we'll find out how fast the waves travel through the tissues, so then we can determine how stiff they are in that specific area compared to the other tissues in that area. And along with the depth limitation, there's also a limitation because of bio effects, and this is kind of the main reason it's not totally in use right now, at least in the States, because we're not totally sure about the effects, the bio effects that AFRI has in the body. So this image here is just showing what ARFI looks like compared to normal B-mode image on a normal liver scan. Okay, and this is a magnetic resonance elastography, or MRE for short. Uh, it's another way shear wave is used. Uh, it's generally used as an image-based counterpart to palpitation. So you know palpitation helps diagnose the presence of disease, um, like inflammation, fibrosis, and of course cancer. Uh, so as you can see, this image clearly is not an ultrasound, but it compares the normal MRI image that's on the left to the shear wave in the middle and the shear stiffness on the far right. And to finish up, poor elastography. So as Tanil has explained about poor elastography, it's generally used to assess the amount of lymph drainage. So generally, we use it for limbs. Uh, this picture shows an example of a normal leg versus a leg that has lymphedemia or lymphedema, which is just that lymph isn't being drained properly. Um, yes, those are our main uses for shear elastography. So a newer technique technique of elastography is ax axial shear strain elastography. This technique is helpful because it depicts how tightly a lesion is anchored to the surrounding tissue. Cancers tend to be tightly anchored, whereas benign lesions have smooth, sliding borders with surrounding tissue. When imaged, thin bands of color at the boundary of a mass is shown for a benign lesion, and a thick blob of color is shown for at the boundary of cancerous lesions, as shown here. Um, axial shear strain elastography images may be easier to interpret than normal, normal elastograms. Um, Stephanie is now going to expand on future applications of elastography. All right, as was uh, already explained, breast elastography is currently used. One study I read titled uh, The Journey of Elastography, Background, Current Status, and Future Possibilities in Breast Cancer Diagnosis displayed this chart comparing the research into elastography alone versus elastography on breast cancer. So you can see that the research on breast cancer elasto elastography is expanding at a much greater rate than the elastography alone. What will this mean for breast cancer detection rates in the future? Will self-breast examination still be necessary if screening elastography can accurately detect lumps early before they can even be palpated with the hands? Maybe this is too hopeful, but it is exciting to think that elastography could catch breast cancer at an even earlier stage, thus increasing survival rates. Some kinks that need to be worked out first would definitely be accessibility for the public and into other countries, and most importantly, also reducing false positives. Future enhancements um, would include increasing the operator knowledge and skills. We need to have all operators um, 
being trained in this uh, elastography. Synchronizing a universal color identification system throughout different machines would be helpful. Researchers are setting up standard displays and setting up a classification score that is common to all machines. Also expanding studies and ex again accessibility into poorer countries as well where this can take us. Other places it can take us are um, from the article titled Liver Ultrasound Elastography, More Than Staging the Disease. Uh, the researchers are encouraged by the ability of clinicians being able to stage where the liver disease is, but uh, think that the future of the elastography can take us one step further. Research into using elastography to predict what form and the pace the liver disease is going at to take, um, it would be beneficial. So if clinicians can predict the way the specific patient's liver disease is going to manifest itself, then both the patient and the clinician can better prepare and uh, treatment plan for this patient, which I'm sure would be beneficial for patient and for the doctor as well. Uh, future thyroid applications. Yes, elastography is currently being used for imaging thyroid nodules. In the study, elastography in distinguishing benign from malignant thyroid nodules, the researchers were comparing grayscale examination, Doppler characteristics, as well as elastography patterns. So you can see that in the picture here. The image of the thyroid nodule compares these three forms side by side. Um, the elastogram can determine the stiffness of the nodule and help determine whether the nodule is benign or malignant. The benefits of elastography allow the patient to have a diagnosis which can eliminate the need for unnecessary surgery or biopsy. The key here is that the researchers are trying to improve the quality and accuracy of elastography in regards to thyroid benign versus malignant diagnosis. And one possible use of elastography is to detect earlier signs of chronic pancreatitis. For example, parenchymal edema can be recognized as a change in tissue stiffness. Also, elastography can help in early detection of pancreatic cancer. Early detection of pancreatic cancer is important because it provides a better prognosis for the patient. Because elastography can be performed as a physical checkup, it may, be help, it may help detect high-risk patients for pancreatic cancer even if they're asymptomatic. If diffuse or focal stiffness is detected, this person can undergo further detailed examination, which may detect early pancreatic cancer. Stiffness imaging of a thoromatous plaque is another area of interest. Vulnerable plaques are known to be much softer than stable plaque. This distinction is important since vulnerable plaque can lead to occlusion. Evaluation of arterial wall stiffness has also been explored because it may be a marker for future atheromatous disease. There are technical challenges that need to be overcome before these techniques are used in clinical settings. Another use is for evaluation of venous thrombosis. This application is important because new thrombi are at a higher risk for embolization than older thrombi. Because the stiffness of a thrombus increases with increasing age, elasticity imaging may offer a way of gauging the age of a thrombus. This can be difficult using grayscale sonography alone. Transplant graft rejection is another area where elasticity imaging shows promise. Graft rejection involves both inflammation and fibrosis, both of which can cause increased stiffness. Liver transplant fibrosis has already been successfully evaluated. With kidney transplants, there is a significant difference in stiffness being noted in patients with low glomerular filtration rate versus those with a normal glomerular filtration rate. Another potential use is for monitoring tumor therapy, especially ablations. Ablative therapies typically increase the stiffness of tissues. In theory, the, the size of the ablated region should correspond to the area of increased stiffness on elastography. This premise has yet to be verified for all types of ablative therapies, but according to one author, the method will likely get widespread use. Another area of promise is the evaluation of cervical stiffness in pregnancy. This application looks for softening of cervix late in pregnancy as an indicator of impending delivery. Tumor stiffness will likely be an additional parameter that will be used to gauge tumor response to chemotherapy and will increase the value of ultrasound for monitoring cancer patients. Many other potential applications are being explored. These include the myocardium musculoskeletal system, skin, salivary glands, and lymphedema. So for conclusion, 
There are two main types of elastography currently used, both providing accurate information about tissue stiffness. Elastography is co constantly advancing with new technologies and applications. It will help us detect and diagnose disease. And that's all we have for elastography. Thank you for your time. Thank you again for watching our video. Hopefully you found it to be useful when it comes to understanding about elastography. If you're ever curious about where we obtained our information, you can find them right here in our references section. And if you're watching these videos to prepare for an exam, good luck studying!